These works are based on the mythological tales collected from Bushman tribes during the years 1870 to 1910 and first published in 1919. From this collection of Bushman folklore, it is clear that they are a people with a great storytelling capacity, poetic and descriptive in their view of their world and the things that shape it. Their descriptions are many times profoundly striking, a feast for the senses, drawing you into their world. When they would meet a traveller, they would pose the question as old as time itself. What news do you bring? And would expect both good and bad as this was. As they say, the nature of the world for good and bad news flows like the wind from far away, carrying on it both good and bad smells. They do not have an established or organised Bushman religion with a priest or another type of religious leader in place, leading the narrative. Instead, their beliefs are carried from one generation to another, through rich stories shared around the fire, and so each Bushman forms his own understanding, opinion and belief regarding the prevalence and power of good and evil spirits. Traditionally, they believed in a world rich with stories and interesting characters. In their genesis, when the world began, there existed only a very dim light before the sun's eventual bright arrival. They believe in the old folk, ancestral figures spanning numerous generations who could shift into any shape they desired at any time they wished to do so. They revere the praying mantis, the sun, moon and stars, and acknowledge the existence of fanciful animals and creatures with spirits of their own. Rain comes from the bountiful goodness of the rain cow, and fountain waters from the water serpent carrying a stone on his head, while the winds that sweep over the land comes from a specific bird. They acknowledge the reanimation of the dead, and believe that death was brought into the world by the hare. Their own circumstances are influenced by celestial bodies like the moons, who starts out fat, but withers away into a mere sickle, eventually dying every month and then is magically resurrected and restored during its lunar cycle, where it grows full and round, once more to proudly rise and fall every day. A significant portion of their customs and folklore are susceptible to fading away, underscoring the pressing need and profound significance of disseminating their vibrant heritage and culture to a society that has, to some extent, grown desensitised to the splendour of the natural world. This is Bushman Myths and Legends, and you are listening to The Law Network. Part 1. How Bushmen Tell Stories As the sun gradually descends beyond the horizon, casting a profound, fiery hue, it envelops the savannah in a final embrace of warmth. The elongated shadows of trees and grass gracefully stretch, painting captivating patterns across the dimly lit landscape. The evening air carries a refreshing chill, infused with the scent of grass intermingling with the fading hum of beetles and the gentle rustle of the breeze. Beneath the open expanse of the Kalahari Desert sky, an aged bushman assumes a crouched position amid the arid grasses and sandy terrain. He adorns a modest animal skin attire that harmonises with the earth-toned environment. The old man selects two straight pieces of wood, the first will be the foundation, and the other the spindle, which will cause friction on the foundation stick. Next he prepares the spindle, a piece of dry wood that he shaped into a smooth cylindrical form. He carves the ends meticulously, ensuring that it's perfectly rounded. He has learned to recognise the subtle differences between woods that are prone to burning and those that are not. Seated cross-legged, the bushman places the spindle onto the foundation stick, the spindle in his capable hands and then he begins the rhythmic motion, a dance that connects him to generations of ancestors. He clamps his hands together at the top of the spindle and then rubs them together, making the spindle twirl and dance of the foundation stick, causing friction and heat. Dust-like particles start to form, and a faint wisp of smoke rises. The smoke smells wonderful with the promise of the warm embrace of a fire. The bushman knows the critical moment is approaching, his skilled hands keep the rhythm steady, his senses attuned to the subtle changes in the wood's texture and the aroma of the smoke. And then it happens. A glimmer of amber. A tiny coal emerges. The bushman's motions become even more focused. He feels the heat growing, the ember glowing brighter as the friction intensifies. With a seasoned touch, he eases the ember onto the tinder, a bundle of dried grass and leaves which catches the spark. He blows gently, coaxing it to life, his breath a lifeline to the burgeoning fire. The ember, 
once born of his patience and skill, now dances with life, casting a warm, flickering light against the backdrop of the desert night. In the heart of the Kalahari, the Bushman has summoned fire from humble sticks, an age-old connection to nature's secrets. His fire becomes a hearth, a source of warmth, light and protection in the vast expanse of the wilderness. The old Bushman smiles warmly, welcoming the arrival of the fire like an old friend. Known as Otar, he is a skilled storyteller, a master of tales. From the shadows behind a bush to his left, his eager audience stealthily emerges, their muted approach betrayed by youthful excitement. He loudly speaks to himself and vocalises his musings about the fate of the ravenous hyena he had encountered earlier, behind the very same bush that the children were now hiding behind. With this, the children bundle into the warm glow of the fire. Among them are two girls and three boys. They giggle loudly, a mixture of excitement and fear for the made-up hyena, which they keep reminding themselves is just a trick played on them by the old man. Otar, the wise old bushman, sits beneath the embrace of a gnarled acacia tree. He wears a tattered yet meticulously patched animal skin cloak that drapes across his shoulders. The cloak has absorbed the colours of the land, fading into red earthy tones that mirror the desert sands and sun-soaked rocks. His skin bears the stories of a life spent under the relentless African sun. Wrinkles crisscross his face, etching lines of experience, each one a testament to the many seasons he has witnessed. Though time has changed his features, his posture remains dignified, a living testament to the resilience of his people. His hands, calloused from a lifetime of crafting tools and utensils, rest gently on his knees. The fingers are both strong and delicate, capable of precise movements and imbued with a profound connection to the land. Beneath his greying hair, his eyes radiate a timeless wisdom. Deep within their rich brown hue lies a spark that reflects the depth of his knowledge and the reservoir of stories he holds within. He gazes upon the horizon, where the moon is rising, its belly painted red with the dust of the Kalahari Desert. It is almost as if he's not just looking at the landscape but communing with it, a silent conversation between a sage and the earth itself. Around his neck hangs a necklace of beads made from ostrich eggshells, and in his eyes sparkled an inextinguishable youthfulness. He speaks softly with a gentle voice, the clicks of his tongue creating a soothing rhythm. No grand gestures, no booming commands, but in his demeanour the quiet strength of ancient wisdom. Ota is a living repository of traditional knowledge, a bridge between generations, and a custodian of the profound relationship his people share with the land. His essence, etched with the essence of the wilderness, is a living embodiment of the timeless wisdom that comes from a life lived in harmony with the natural world. His wife Aya has now joined them, and each child, taking the example of the old man, had gathered a flat rock to sit on. They had also brought gifts of a sort, in the form of wood for the fire which they had placed in a neat pile next to Aya. She is a diminutive figure, her stature even smaller than his, but despite her petite frame her spirit is unyielding. She moves with a quiet grace, her steps measured and deliberate, as if each movement is imbued with intention and purpose. Her hands, though weathered and worn, are a testament to a lifetime of labour and love. They are hands that have nurtured, tended and shaped their world. Her voice is a gentle whisper with the same rhythmic clicks of her tongue. When she speaks, even Otar listens. Her eyes, though softened by the passage of time, still hold a spark of curiosity and mischief. The children scurry to find their seats, and then after a short silence they start begging the old man to tell them the stories of the old ones. In a soothing tone, Otar gently urges the young ones to exercise patience, offering them his reassurance that he remains true to his commitment. The comforting flames of the evening fire dance among them, casting a warm glow that highlights their eager and animated expressions. Gradually, a subtle shift in his voice signals the imminent commencement of a tale, and with a sparkle in his eyes, he begins weaving a narrative that captures their attention. He conveys to the children that on this particular night, he would regale them with tales of times long past. In those eras, the Bushmen didn't inhabit these lands, Indeed, the very concept of Bushmen, as they perceive them today, had yet to take shape. He imparts to them that the current generation of Bushmen are the descendants of those ancestral figures from those distant epochs. 
He endeavours to make them grasp that his words don't pertain to recent yesterdays, or the days directly preceding this one. Instead, he directs their attention to a much more ancient past, the obscure times shrouded in darkness. He transports them back to the days when the sun, the moon and the stars had only just begun to grace existence in the world of long ago. In that instant, one of the exuberant young boys couldn't contain his curiosity any longer and interjected, questioning the commencement of the sun, the moon and the stars. Otar, with a serene gesture, laid his hand upon the head of the eager child and urged him to exercise patience, assuring that all would soon be unveiled. With a gentle smile, he addressed the children, explaining that he chose his words deliberately, for he possessed fewer tongues than teeth, implying that he couldn't express everything all at once. He playfully implored them to grant him the time he needed. This light-hearted response elicited laughter from the children, forging a connection between the storyteller and his captivated audience. Otar continued. He delved into those ancient shadowed times, revealing the existence of a distinct breed of bushmen who once wandered these very lands, the old folk. They possessed the uncanny ability to seamlessly shift into the forms of animals, a transformation that occurred in the blink of an eye. This enchanting ability led to the realisation that many of the animals still observed in the present day were nothing more than the manifestations of those very old bushmen from eras gone by. He imparted this revelation to the young, wide-eyed faces before him, their expressions illuminated by the gentle radiance of the crackling fire. Seated beside Otar, Aya leaned in nearer to the fire's warmth. In solidarity with the elder storyteller, she addressed the children, emphasising the need to grasp that in those ancient times, the old folk bushmen were tasked with tending to their offspring with far greater diligence than the current era demands. This care was essential to prevent the adept old sorcerers from swiftly seizing the young ones. She continued, explaining to the captivated audience around the fire that while the ancient ones lacked the same level of intellect as contemporary people, they had the ability to wield strong magic. The tender smile on old Otar's face reassures the concerned little faces as he maintains his soothing composed tempo. He picks up the narrative where Aya left off, explaining that indeed, in those distant times it was a reality to spot an individual standing alone atop a hill. Should you call out to them, your words would fall upon silent ears. They would merely wave and motion for you to join them. Driven by curiosity, you would draw nearer, only to find that when you arrived at the spot, the person had vanished entirely. In their place, a tree laden with delectable fruits would remain. Despite scouring behind the tree and scanning the surroundings for any signs of their presence, the enigmatic individual would remain elusive. Abandoning the pursuit, you'd turn back to the tree, intent on enjoying the fruit. Yet, in a bewildering transformation, the tree's bounty would be replaced by a fearsome lion. Paralysed by terror, you'd inch away from the impending danger, one frightened step at a time. Suddenly, the lion would jump up at you, giving you a terrible fright, and just as you think your life was ending, the beast would change in mid-air, and turn into a graceful springbok, showcasing its striking white markings as it pranced around the shocked onlooker. In a matter of moments, the springbok might morph into a gentle rabbit, tenderly licking your fingers. Such was the nature of the old folk, capricious and unpredictable, today one form, tomorrow another. Otar assures them that they were imbued with pleasantness and a zest for amusement during those bygone days. Old Otar then continued and told them that some would say those weren't good days, but that he would say they were a mixture. Dangerous or not dangerous, truthful or not truthful, whether they touched our lives or had no effect on us at all, it was all the same to him in the end, he said. Those are all things from before our time, and we decide what role they play in our lives. He sternly asked the children, Will anyone say that the fish in the cold river water has it harder than salamander on the warm sand? or that the tortoise gets wetter on the ground in the rain than the birds up there among the wet branches. No, they all live according to their nature and they are content with it. And so we live our lives as well according to our nature and we decide if we are content and happy or not. As the night's chill grows more palpable, Otar eases in closer to the fire's embrace. It's remarkable how near a bushman can sit to the flames without being scorched by the heat. 
He positions himself so that the smoke gently wafts under his chin, while the firelight dances within his eyes. When the smoke veils his face, he tilts his head in alignment with the wind's direction, and this simple adjustment allows him to continue unfazed. His eyes remain untouched by the sting of smoke. Old Otar's readiness becomes evident, and he initiates the storytelling of his people. Every so often, the elderly lady interjects with a word or two, interweaving the wisdom passed down from her mother, grandmother, aunts and other venerable women during her own childhood, a time when she was no older than the children seated before her now. Occasionally, a red hunting spider or a scorpion would dart past the fire, causing the little ones to startle. Yet Ota seems unperturbed, paying these creatures little mind. At times, Aya would gesture toward the critter and remark that the old ones enjoyed the stories as well. Are you ready? Ota asks with one final raise of the eyebrows, and with that, the stories begin. Next time, we'll encounter the tale of Night and Darkness and their three daughters. This is Bushman Myths and Legends, and you are listening to The Law Network.